I'd like to introduce our introducer. Uh, here to introduce tonight's speaker is Dr. Nancy Rigani. She's not only the Associate Chief of General Internal Medicine here at Mass General, but she's also the Director of the Office of Women's Careers here. She's here tonight for a welcome on behalf of this lecture series co-sponsor, the Mass General Research Institute. Please welcome Dr. Rigani. So I'm very pleased to be here to introduce our speaker, which, so I'll be short. But uh, before we started, I actually did want to take a moment to ask you, if you'd raise your hand, how many people um, are aware that NGH has the largest hospital-based research enterprise in the country? Oh my gosh, where do you do? Well, the average person doesn't know that. <laughs> um, and, um, and so that's one of the reasons that the NGH Research Institute got launched, um, to serve as a front door for promoting our research to uh, everyone else uh, who doesn't know about us. There are more than 6,000 researchers who are working at Mass General and more than 30 institutes and centers and departments. So we're really quite far flung. Um, and we're all united in trying to improve human health. Um, and so basically the research is it gives us a, an umbrella or a, a tent. It's a very big umbrella and a very big tent uh, or a brand that we can uh, use to let everybody else know about the many things we do. Uh, as you probably know, there's lots of remarkable scientific advances being made every day, but uh, federal funding for research is getting tight. I know, I have grant going tomorrow, and I've been up many, many nights. Um, competition for grants is getting harder, and uh, the funding base is shifting from fundamental discovery to outcomes research. So the Research Institute was founded to promote, support, and guide our diverse acti research act enterprise. Um, it's been part of the, research has been part of the hospital's mission since its founding more than 200 years ago. And research is why the treatment that you get here is as good as it is, and the treatment you'll get tomorrow is better than you would get today because of the discoveries that we're making. Um, I encourage you all to learn more about the research institute. That you're probably sitting on this if you didn't pick it up, um, but it's, it's really a cute card. Um, so we're, ta we're focusing in this series on women in medicine. Um, clearly women have been instrumental to the care of patients, but also to the research enterprise here um, throughout, its, throughout MGH's history. And you'll see there's just a wonderful exhibit that got put together showing some of the women who have been involved in uh, the healthcare and research at Mass General in many different ways, not just physicians, but also uh, many other kinds of uh, professionals. Uh, and so I encourage you to read it because it's really great. Um, after the talk, <laughs> um, not right now. So um, today, tonight we're going to hear about a very we're going to hear from a very special woman in, in healthcare, and that's Alice Flaherty. She's a writer, a neurologist here at MGH, and an associate professor in psychiatry and neurology at Harvard Medical School. During her research fellowship, she wrote a book called *The Midnight Disease*, an award-winning nonfiction book about the neural basis of creativity. That was called by several major newspapers as one of the best books of 2004. Her current book project is on the boundaries and points of contact between illness, health, and the arts. Please welcome Dr. Flaherty. So uh, I, I wanted to, can you hear me okay? I tend to get quiet and fast, so just raise your hand if I start going too fast. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk about what uh, the writer Nancy Mayers has called the literature of personal disaster, which she has written a couple of entries in herself. And um, that's perhaps a cynical way of describing what personal illness, illness narratives can be, and they can be a lot of things. Uh, but I, I, um, I guess maybe I should say initially like why I'm talking about it, or what my expertise is. And I, Basically, it's that my, I and my family have put the partners, the Mass General Healthcare uh, Insurance, to really good use. <laughs> so during like a 10-year period, my husband had a collapsed lung, then he had a, um, a tension pneumothorax, my daughter got um, meningitis, and I won't, I, won't, I will say a few of the other things later, but like I feel like I should say my creds of like, we are, we've been really sick, but then we got better. 
And um, that's the kind of happy illness scenario that most people prefer. So um, we're not actually dead. The, uh, the reason I put up this great Tom Gold drawing here is that uh, when you think about the whole realm of things people can write about, why would you take, like, really, there's only, of all these different characters that can be in an epic tale, in medicine, there's like three different types. There's the patient, there's caretakers, and then there's bystanders. And bystanders can be, you know, your boss or your high school boyfriend or whatever. But uh, so it's a big, big important class. But there's only three. And all the other great ones, like the talking shrub, just don't get in the in the book. So, uh, and I, I, I'm gonna. I guess maybe the questions as I was thinking when I was asked to speak about this is like why anybody would write these books, you know, why I did, and, and or not books, but just any kind of narrative. And then also the second question, of course, is why anyone or who would want to read them. Um, maybe I'll also step back. I'd love to define things because I'm an academic, so I want to say that I'll be talking about personal illness narratives in the sense of a, a sort of a, um, a story rather than what a doctor would call the medical history, which is what you tell uh, the nurse or the doctor when you go in and you're in the cold exam room sitting in that paper gown. Um, and there's actually a problem that I'll talk about later, which is that personal illness narratives are actually pretty bad training for giving a medical history, and you can get into trouble if you confuse the two. Uh, so um, why would people write it, illness narrative? And the first is kind of a facile answer. All of my answers are facile tonight. Uh, but the first one is venting, and um, the idea that if you describe your suffering, that you'll feel better. And that, I think, in many communities is a very, um, it just seems like, of course. Uh, and so I put Philip Tidis up here as the poster child. Some of you may know he was one of, he was, he sailed with Odysseus, and he got some horrible wound in his foot with, from a poisoned arrow, I think, and it smelled so bad that the crew stuck him on a desert island. They just left. And so then he was stuck there with this horrible festering wound for like 10 years. I think later he was rescued and cured and then went on to kill some people. But uh, I think the reason I put him up was that Henri Gide wrote an interesting modernization and dramatization of his story in which Philoctetes learns he's all alone and what can he do? And he starts telling his story to himself. And there's a wonderful line which I should have written down because so I'm going to have to ad lib it, which was that um, I, I learned to tell my, my tale, and if I told it well enough, I felt better. It sounded better in French. Uh, but he, the, so he's, he's sort of the first venture, but he had no, no audience. And I, many people who write about their illness start out that way. They're writing to themselves. And uh, so the thing about venting, when I was an intern and we were in the medical ICU, which was our nastiest rotation, we were supposed to go to these vent sessions. And um, I was brought up in this like very waspy um, small town. And I was not brought up to vent. Like we didn't even have facial expressions. I didn't <laughs> see any until I got to college. And um, so I hated those sessions. I wasn't, you know, I was there. I was taught that like, the only thing you should say, if someone says, how are you, you should say, fine. There's like no other appropriate answer. <laughs> and um, so my friend Jonathan Roseanne um, said, oh, well, you know, you don't understand. That's just because you're not Jewish. You don't understand how to complain right. There's a way that you can do it in which you would feel better. And I was like, well, this is really not working for me. Um, he said, well, but you should just go through some psychotherapy because the purpose of psychotherapy is to tell, tell wasps teach them how to complain right. And so I thought, well, that's kind of an interesting idea. You know, I'm like I'm pondering on this. And, and I said, um, and so then like psychotherapy for Jewish people would teach them how to have like a stiff upper lip and stuff. And it's like, no, no, it's not, not what it's about. Uh, so I never did get to like those sessions very much. And I was pretty much uptight all the way through my residency. Um, and then what happened, which maybe I'll talk about a little bit later, was I had, um, I was pregnant with twins and they, they died at birth. And um, it, was, it was a very complicated pregnancy. And, um, and it was a really horrible and painful experience and much more distressing than I expected as a wasp to, to be distressed. You know, I was just, uh, found that I really wasn't functioning well at all. And I ended up seeing a psychiatrist. I was sent by my chairman who was like, well, that's actually a whole other funny story, which I shouldn't tell her unless she gives me permission to. Um, but she, uh, 
she, uh, she had me go to the psychiatrist and I really did find it was really helpful. And so maybe about a year after I started that, uh, I was having lunch with Jonathan. And, um, and I said, you know, Jonathan, I don't know what it is today. I just feel so weak. I don't know why. And he said, oh my god, it's Yom Kippur. Your therapy is working. <laughs> so I become more, more, uh, more Jewish through my psychotherapy. And, and I got a lot of other benefits from it as well. Um, but so now I'm a, I'm a little bit better about talking about personal trauma, but I still have this ambivalence, which I'll bring out because there are some, there are some downsides to some aspects of this. And I want to, you know, give them some coverage too. So one of the, it, but it, it still interests me, like why, why is venting helpful? And, and actually a lot of writers, well one writer, I, I took care of the, the writer William Styron for a while, and this is not a HIPAA violation, he, he gave me full permission to talk about him. And uh, he, I remember um, once he, he was lying in bed, he opened one eye and said, why do people write? And I'm like, hello, you, know, you should be telling me you're the writer. And uh, he said, well, I think I write to remember, to, to preserve um, what's happened. And, um, and that made some sense to me. Uh, but then I remember there's also a great Kafka quote where someone asked him why he wrote about all these, these painful things. And he said, I write in order to shut my eyes. And so for him, writing out was really getting it out of him, putting it away, you could put it in a drawer. And uh, so that's an aspect of venting that, um, that is sort of the opposite of dwelling on, on what happened to you. But it's, the tension there has actually become sort of a medical issue in terms of debriefing after trauma. And so if you remember um, after uh, the World Trade Center um, on 9-11 that all, every psychotherapist in the country rushed to, to uh, Manhattan to help out. And so they actually started doing some studies to see if getting people to talk about their trauma right afterwards was helpful or if it just made it more painfully burnt into their memory. And this, the, for a while, it was actually looking like for everybody it was bad. It was a bad thing. But now there, it's a little more nuanced. And it's pretty clear for some people it's helpful to write and think about things, and other people it's not. Um, but there have been some other very interesting studies where, which I still can't, even though I want to believe them, I'm still not sure I do. One of them, for example, took several groups of patients. One was people with rheumatoid arthritis, <coughs> I think asthma, maybe one other disease and had them spend like two hours in the morning just sat them down and said, write about your illness and what you've been going through. And they measured, um, in the ar arthritis people, they measured joint angles, like how, how straight they can get their joints and stuff uh, beforehand. And then a month after this very small intervention, and they showed that there was a statistically significant increase in their joint flexibility, which was presumably from this, uh, from this ability to release emotional tension and and maybe to process some of the things they were going through and come up with better solutions as they were writing, perhaps. And um, they also did it with asthma and found that people's lung vital capacity in increased. So um, there have been a few other studies like this, scattered studies, and um, no one's ever disproven it, so it's gotta be true. It's just fine, it's hard to believe, but it, it might be true. Um, again, it's like my waspiness, I oh, can't help to talk about yourself. Um, but there's another tension, I think, um, besides like, what venting does, whether it burns painful memories or helps to process them, which is there's this, this tension between, all of us have in medicine, if we're a patient, between being stoic and being expressive. And when is it good to complain, and when is it good to not complain? And that's an incredibly painful issue, I think, for patients every day, at least it always was, has been for me. And, um, and the, did I think I had a, I am all, all my slides are about poster children today. Yeah, Epictetus. So he was one of the early Stoics. And it's an interesting story about him is that he actually had been uh, a slave for many years and was apparently in chronic pain from a deformed leg. And the, the story anyway was that it was deformed because of a beating from a, from a um, slave master. So he had a pretty awful life in some respects, although he became late in life very well known as a philosopher. And he had you know, the classic Stoic philosophy of not either expressing or feeling pain or joy or, or pretty much anything. You were just supposed to be Stoic. And uh, that, um, that's a very, very useful strategy in, in many ways. But remember, for you to be perceived as Stoic, I'm sorry, am I getting some, some um, feedback? Um, 
for you to be perceived as stoic, people have to think you're in pain too. Like no one's gonna say, oh, he's so brave, unless they know it's hurting. So that's easy if you've got a deformed leg, but for people who have illnesses that no one can see, you're kind of stuck because no one will ever call you stoic. They'll just think that you're just like doing your thing. And um, so there, that's one of the things that, that I thought a lot about when I was sick. But there's also this urge, if you are stoic, you have an urge to talk about what's bothering you, and what do you do? You, some, you, know, you wanna whisper it in the reeds, like Midas, I'm getting all my Greek myths confused today. But just whisper it somewhere that no one will hear, and that's what writing is really good for. So that's why I turned to writing, because I was an introvert, and I didn't wanna be talking to people about my problems, <laughs> but I could write because you know, it was just me. You know? So that was, that was sort of how I started out, and, um, and in fact, I remember how when, uh, when I, people would read stuff that I wrote and they said, well, why, why don't you publish this? And that was like saying, well, why don't you have sex in public? Like, like you know, you could really enjoy something, but maybe not want to do it with everybody. Um, and so I was kind of at that stage for a while, and I'll tell you later how that changed. Um, but I think I did write a lot especially at the beginning, to spare my listeners from having to listen, that I could just write it and stick it in a drawer. Um, but, but that compulsion to talk about what was bothering me kind of interested in me, and actually what brought it to a head was my first and fairly minor illness, which was, I think I was a junior resident, and I was climbing an apple tree in my backyard to, um, to pick some apples, which I have to say is like right now is an obsession with mine. There's all these abandoned apple trees in Cambridge, and you can just get loads of apples right now. So but that time I was climbing up and all of a sudden I had this horrible belly pain. I was like, did I pull a muscle? So I get, went back to the kitchen and I'm sitting there feeling pretty bad and, and he said, oh, what's wrong? And I'm like, I don't know, it's like maybe gas? And he's like, well, if it's gas, why are you moaning? And I was like, oh, oh and so I stopped moaning, you know. And then a few minutes later I was moaning again. So I thought the little bit of me that wasn't just moaning was like, oh, that's so interesting. Why am I moaning? And um, I'm gonna skip ahead to a, I'm gonna skip to a different trauma. <laughs> that, that story goes off in a whole different, no, no, actually it's important to tell the rest. So I put off going to the hospital for a super long time, and you could say it was because I was stoic, but really what it was, I didn't want to be humiliated by having it be just gas, and then being in minor, like in the way back part of the hospital, or the ER, and have all my friends like see me there and think, oh my God, she came to the ER for gas? That's like, so, you know. So doctors, it's very important that we, we think that we're stoic. Um, but, but I remember thinking, why were those moans so involuntary and why do some people moan? Like you moan if you have a belly pain, but you don't moan if your arm hurts, you scream, you know. So I got kind of interested in these, these pain vocalizations. And, uh, and that came about more, more interesting when I was hit by a truck. I was picking up my, um, <laughs> my kids. I was biking out there, and, um, and I, a truck came by and sort of clipped my foot, and sort of, it's called a degloving injury. I love the story stories. That's one thing doctors love. So it was like peeled off the bottom of my leg. And uh, so I was lying on the ground screaming, and of course everyone came over, and they were dialing on their little cell phones. It was in Kendall Square, so there were a lot of techies. And, um, and the, you know, the ambulance came in like a minute or two, and as soon as they were there, I stopped screaming. And I, I had been watching my screams, thinking, I think I should probably cut these stories short, <laughs> thinking, um, like, why am, I, why am I screaming? And then help came, and I stopped screaming, and I was like, oh, it was to attract aid, of course, that's why I was screaming. Like, I had to learn that the hard way. Um, but the, what was the point of that? Oh, yeah. So. So there is something involuntary about a lot of illness behavior that's to attract pain. Like for instance, animals who don't have uh, like large troops to support, like solitary monkeys, they don't show, they don't have very much pain behavior at all. Whereas uh, macaques and, and other animals that live in big troops, like they'll, they have all sorts. Of, like basically, I used to run with the head bed at um, MIT, where you would go through the frog room and the you know, the mouse room and the monkey room and so forth. And the monkeys, if they had a stomach ache, they would go like this and they'd hold their hand out for the tongues that he would give them. These were monkeys that were being trained in various experiments. Or they would hold their head, you know, so it was, they were very gestural in that respect. And so there is a sense in which the reason we like to vent is because venting gets us aid sometimes, at least. And so it feels good, even, even when no one likes through sort of classical conditioning, then we feel better just by venting because we know a lot of times good things come out of that. And um, the reason that I bring this up is partly that 
when you're writing for other people to read it, like for publication, that's not why they're going to be reading it, you know. And, and you have to sort of change your your thinking about it when when you are writing for yourself versus writing and or maybe for your family versus then if you're thinking maybe you would publish it. Um, and that's a sort of sometimes difficult transition to make. But then if you think about recruiting aid, so writing might be good in that respect because you get to pu um, to to practice your rhetoric. You know, how can you make people feel your pain and. and Bill Styron was great that way. Like you could really see him working on his his language to get people to notice, and he was suffering a lot. He was very very ill then. Um, but there was a problem, which is that it turns out doctors are, and probably built to a lesser extent, other caregivers are really freaked out by literary language. And so he would use these beautiful metaphors, and it would just like either they would think, oh my god, this is like so overblown, this can't be real, and think he was making it up, or they would overreact to his metaphors, like he would say, I'm suffering like Jesus, and they would think, he thinks he's Jesus, and they think he's hallucinating. <laughs> so you have to be careful with literary language, because again, it's very different from the kind of story that you would tell a doctor when you'd say, oh, I'm a, you know, a G2P1, 35-year-old um, female, blah, 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 um, <laughs> which is what they want to hear. Uh, because it's, it, and in our defense, we have to read so much medical writing, and it's so different from human speech right. that that we <laughs> lose the ability to read normal, normal or hear real metaphors. Um, so, so there's a um, maybe I'll talk about this in a little bit. I have to talk about it here because I put my slides in this order. Oh, that was what I was supposed to. He was supposed to be looking at that now. Um, while well, I was talking about that. So let's see what's next. So there's another thing that writing can do for you, which um, it can be a distraction from pain. There's a great story about Friedrich Nietzsche that when he had migraines, he would walk through the Alps as fast as he could and think about what he was writing. Or actually, maybe that was some mathematician. Anyway, somebody was suffering a lot, and he would, he would walk and, and do mental, mental um, exercises to bring his mind off it. And I put up this wonderful um, painting, some of you may know, it's a Jesse Wilcox Smith illustration of um, Robert Louis Stevenson's poem, The Land of Counterpain, did any of you know that? And um, it describes a little boy um, who is trapped in bed, and Stevenson was sick a lot as a child, and uh, how he managed to turn his bed into a, a, a land with you know, the soldiers and his, his knees are the hills and so forth. And there's this lovely play on the word pain, you know, counterpain, and he's trying to forget his pain. And several writers have talked about illness as being a sort of safe space where you can uh, use this extra time that you have and explore ideas uh, without the pressures of having to report to a boss or anything. And, uh, and at the same time, it can take your mind off your pain. And, and that, was actually, that was something that was very helpful for me. Um, so the, uh, in fact, there's some evidence that a lot of writers, more than average, were sick as children. Um, let's see what's on my next slide to talk about. So another reason people write about their illness is they want to make sense of events. And there's a very practical way in which you might make sense, like you might actually think about um, you know, how to get out of this situation. And then there's the more, uh, the more like capital M meaning of um, why is this happening to me? And I put up Victor Frankl's book as, as really a great uh, representative of that genre. He was, this, it wasn't strictly an illness, he was in a concentration camp and uh, wrote about that experience and it made him realize how important it is to have a sense of meaning wherever the meaning comes from. And he tried to help other prisoners sort of as a psychiatrist while he was there to gain that. And it's a really lovely book. Um, and then on the other hand, the danger is that you see a lot of weird false meanings that people invent, invent about their illness. So I put Ken Heat up as the sort of the example of the opposite thing, which is, if any of you know that story, it's a young man who's raised in this bucolic valley, and then every possible nasty thing happens to him. But he's been raised by this philosopher, Pangloss, who tells him that everything um, is for the best and the best of all possible worlds. And so all this stuff that happens to him, it's just ridiculous, bad, horrible stuff. Um, he's, he just tries to realize why that was a good thing, you know? And this, of course, is a big wasp tradition that I'm very familiar with. Um, it's a good thing. And so you see people will say, you know, no pain, no gain, or, oh, it was great that I got cancer because I met my future wife as who was the chemotherapy nurse and stuff like that. So it all had a purpose. And that's kind of okay, you know? I mean, that, if people are going to 
make sense of their life that way. But the problem is that you can really think yourself into a false view of the world. And one of the things about our personal narratives is that they can trap us. In fact, um, I think Janet Malcolm was writing about um, sometimes the purpose of psychiatry, for example, is to get people to unlearn the stories that they have about themselves, not to give them a coherent view of things, but to sort of unlearn that idea of themselves as like the abused child or whatever that's trapping them in a certain pattern of behavior. So we have to worry when we write um, what we're writing, what corner we're writing ourselves into. Um, and just recently, I'm reading somebody who wrote about, you know, there's another type of narrative, which is a chaos narrative, where it just doesn't make sense. Often this is people in the first stages of when they're writing about stuff, and they just write it all down. It, they're just, it's just pure, like, um, primary source material. It's all scrambled in their head. And this is actually um, an example of a, a schizophrenic um, artist who felt he had to use all the available space. It's actually a characteristic of schizophrenic art called horror evacuate. But, um, but so sometimes you get people who, the, the meaning that they found is that there's no meaning. And all of us kind of recoil from that because we're meaning machines. Like humans are, we're looking for meanings everywhere. But we have to honor the fact that sometimes there is no meaning. And sometimes there's pain that just doesn't have any purpose. It's just pain. And it just makes you sicker. It's not, you know, the great Nietzsche line about um, that which does not kill me makes me stronger. Actually, no. <laughs> Most of what doesn't kill you just makes you really weak, and it's only when you get little tiny, you know, little tiny bits of weakness at a very low level that you can actually get stronger. Um, so the uh, another, the I just want to say a little bit more about how narratives can trap you because this was an experience I had. Um, so after I had after my um, the death of my twins, I actually have real live twins now. I had later got pregnant and twins again. So if you hear me talking about some live twins, that's why. Um, so afterwards, I you know I got pretty. Uh, I actually had a manic break or sort of dysphoric manic break. So I was quite unhappy, but I was talking a mile a minute, and I wrote all the time. And actually, that got me interested in the subject of uh, the book that Nancy mentioned about creativity, like why I was writing so much. I mean, I would write on. Toilet paper, I, would, I tried to write on my arm while I was bicycling because I had all these ideas and they seemed so important to me. And, and um, so I got interested in what wires were crossed in my brain to make me do that. And I wrote a book about um, creativity and where it comes from in the brain and, and also writer's block. Like when, when I couldn't write, what, you know, what was that about? Was it the same area not working or was it unrelated? Uh, and the, is that my phone? Um, <laughs> The, so the book became very popular, and, and one of the things that made me realize was 90% of why people liked it was actually the few little bits of personal story that I had in it. The rest of it was all me theorizing and talking about facts and stuff. And everyone would say, you know, that was such a, it was a wonderful memoir, and you know, I hope you write more about yourself. And I was, it was like maybe a bit in the intro and a bit in the last chapter. Um, and that kind of what made me realize how important it is to have a narrative because, um, there's, well, I'll talk about this later, but there's, you know, these undigestible facts that we just can't remember unless they're put into some kind of story about a person. But then, so the book was pretty popular. I ended up being on, like, all these TV shows, and I became kind of the, the poster child for mentally ill doctors. Or Like, my story, <laughs> like, if I was going to put it into a, a bullet, it would be, like, Harvard doctor mom goes crazy, writes book, you know? And so that was my thing. And, um, and it made me able to comment on mental illness because I was like, you know, not just like in hair, you know, those old hair club from there, men ads where I'm not just a, I'm not just the president, I'm also a, a, a user, whatever. So, so I could talk about mental illness from a firsthand point of view. And so I ended up talking to a lot of different groups, and after, and I did my best to sort of accurately represent what I had experienced. But the problem was after a while, it became so rote. It was like. Like what they say about in Alcoholics Anonymous, where people tell their story over and over again at every meeting, and it becomes, I had like this drunk along that was like, <laughs> that I could just feel out, and it became, it felt like this real rigid persona that was exactly like me, but it was sort of, it was artificial. And that was actually quite a, a weird experience. And the worst thing was, and it was, it was useful in the sense that at that point I was having to deal with mental illness, and I had never thought of myself as mentally ill. 
although it turned out some people in my family had, but I didn't know that. And um, the uh, and so I had to sort of rearrange my my sense of self, and that was hard. You know, I had to. So I got into I sort of got into that project. Like I'm going to rethink how I am and everything. And just about the time I got used to my diagnosis and all my friends were mentally ill and I was like okay with it and I could talk about it on public television and stuff, then I realized that it actually started to get better. And it was awful because then I had to like, I couldn't use some of my excuses like, oh, I can't take out the garbage because I've got, you know, um, melancholic depression or whatever. Um, I had to just take out the garbage and, and un undo like this persona that I invented. So that was sort of disturbing. So narratives can trap you, like they, they don't change quite as fast as you do, at least in my case. Um, and, oh, I thought I was gonna, let's see. The, you may have noticed I've never given this talk before, that's why it's so disorganized, I apologize. Um, why was I going to talk about this now? Um, so, well, I, this is something that bothers me all the time, I may as well talk about it here as at the end, which is where I thought I was gonna talk about it, which is, the, the, this tension between my story or anybody's story and um, and actual relevance to my audience because anecdotes are really really powerful and that's what I learned from my book where the anecdote was what people remembered um, and the data that that maybe say this is relevant to you or to you those are, are it's a whole different thing so um, you know, I could tell you anecdotes about wonderful cures that would make you want to do leaching. You know, have people take, draw your blood or whatever to get you to feel better. And uh, I forget who, who said this. I think it's not really clear who first said this, but the plural of anecdote is not data. So if several people tell you this story. It doesn't mean that this pill is going to work for you. And um, so that's that's something that's true of everything I say here. So in this, let me, this, is, this picture is so lovely, it's the convalescent by um, Caroline Durant. It's so much more memorable than that chart over there, right? Um, so, let's see where we are. Um, oh, I don't think I have a slide for this. But, so then there's another reason to write personal illness narratives, which is, these days anyway, to sell books. And um, so I didn't really start out writing for that reason. But there was a very good reason in my situation to do that, which was if I was just writing madly all the time, and it didn't, you know, did nothing came about, then I was, that was mental illness, that was hypergraphia. But if I sold the book, then, then I'm a writer, you know, then I'm not mentally ill, I'm, I'm an author. And, uh, so that was pretty cool. And, uh, but it leads us to a very important question, um, which I'll talk about in a minute, which is why would anyone want to read the, the book that I wrote? Um, but I also want to just take a little bit of a side step into um, why, uh, what about caregivers writing personal illness narratives? Because many people have had the painful experience of taking care of a relative who's very ill, or doctors uh, are now encouraged to write about their patient experiences and their own experiences. And it's kind of, a, it's a little bit of a different genre, but it's, it's very closely related, of course. And there's a huge number of famous doctors or people who trained in medicine like Keats. Um, many of them are from Harvard. I just want to like pump, um, you know, I'm preparation age, so I was an undergraduate there and graduate <laughs> school. So Harvard has turned out a bunch of them. It's not because med school teaches you how to write. Oh my God, it's the opposite. Um, but there are so many wonderful stories that our patients have, and we we get to um, be. It's a really a privilege to um, get to know people so well that, that I think that's. That's what drives us to write, even though all our training is in using passive constructions and really long words and stuff. Um, and so I thought a little bit about why caregivers would want to write. And there's actually a school of narrative medicine that was sort of centered at Columbia, of narrative medicine, which really encourages doctors to specifically to write about their patient and med students and so forth. And um, and it, it, it actually started to disturb me a little bit because um, there was this sense that you could, like, the, the model was really that you would read your patient like a book or turn them into a book. And it was very much like the doctor was the artist and the patient was, was either the blank page or the raw material. Uh, which, when doctors talk about writing, we often talk about, like, the lit crit that we learned in college, like, 200 years ago. And it's actually pretty um, outdated. There's some things we can learn from literary criticism now, and, and one of them is the... Um, the, the post-colonial uh, sort of rethinking of 
of writing and who gets to tell their own story rather than having somebody else tell their story about them. I love this picture. Um, this is by an Indian artist talking, you know, the idea of tourism. And the best example of sort of medical uh, tourism, uh, you know, the way we, we can sometimes sort of co-opt our patient stories is if you look at JAMA, you know, this well-known medical journal, and they have this thing which has always bothered me where doctors can like submit uh, photos that they've taken and they're almost always of their trips to like uh, far off places in the world they take pictures of like poor people and so they're always like very picturesque poor people and, and they're beautifully lit with their really super expensive cameras and so forth and and the, the, the way that they've turned these people and their lives into like little objets that get stuck at the end of articles when they have blank space is, is something that doctors and I think all care caregivers have to be aware of, much less so if, if you're writing about a family member, of course. But even then, we can turn patients into things that they don't necessarily think of themselves as. And it's important to keep in mind that as a caregiver, you feel like you're having so much empathy for your patient. And empathy is a very, very strong emotion and, and really powerful and useful, but it's also something that you're feeling and it may have nothing to do with what your patient feels. I should have put in a slide, there's a great one of a, a woman with a, a tarantula on her face that um, one of the talent Reese uses here as an example of how we can feel this really visceral empathy. Because you see this picture and it's like your skin crawls and you're like, ah, and you feel so sorry for her. In fact, if you look carefully, that's a woman with a pet tarantula. She's smiling, she's got eyeshadow on. It's like she's just letting the thing crawl in her face because she doesn't bother her. So your sense of empathy was totally your stuff and not hers. And so all of us as caregivers have to remember that. Um, and when my husband was sick, he made that very clear. <laughs> so so it, you know, it's useful to um, let people tell their own stories to the extent that you can. That being said, I've, I've really been so amazed at how writing about my patients has helped me get to, to know them better. And at first I was very anxious when I would do it. And, and I remember asking this, this little guy, um, See there, that's patronizing, right? He didn't think of himself as a little old guy. Um, but I, so I asked him, um, you know, to, to read this and see if he thought it represented what he'd gone through, and I was a little nervous. He said, oh, this is great, you know? And I said, well, can you help me think of like a, a pseudonym for you? And he's like, pseudonym? 85 years? You know, I've waited 85 years to get in a book, and now you want me to appear as a pseudonym? So I want to be Mario DeSantis, you know? So, so people, people didn't always mind it, my writing about them as much as I thought they would. Um, but there are some great examples of, uh, if you look at somebody, a caregiver's narrative versus the narrative of the patient themselves, and a few examples, one is, uh, is Freud's, uh, Freud wrote a, a piece about a, a man with mental illness called Daniel Paul Schraber, where it analyzes his latent homosexuality and where all his fears come from, and then you read Daniel Schreiber actually wrote his own book called Memoirs of My Mental Illness, which is fascinating. And really, it was about symptom management from an incredibly different point of view. Very intelligent guy, was a judge. Actually, I think went back to work after five or six years of being in an asylum. And um, one of the things that was the worst problem for him, at least from his point of view, was tunes getting stuck, from, stuck in his head. And he couldn't get them out, and they were torturous. And all the things he would do, like playing on the piano or or bellowing, he had a bellowing cure, so trying to get these tunes out of his head. Uh, and these were things that, you know, from Freud's view of what was going on were just irrelevant. Um, these days, actually, cowball is great for getting tunes out of your head. I mean, seriously, I have a patient who's a, um, a composer, and he has Tourette's syndrome, so he takes um, cowball to keep his Tourette's under control. And he says that um, it's also turned out to be great for getting Britney Spears and, like, pop 20 tunes out of his head but that he had to really be careful about titrating it. He needed to have like just enough to get rid of those tunes, but not to get rid of the tunes that he needed to compose. Um, and where was I? I'm not talking about how well. Uh, just some other examples of, oh, there's another great example of um, Oliver Sacks who was writing about um, Tourette's and traveled around with Lowell Hand Handler, who's a photographer with Tourette's syndrome. And then you read Lowell Handler's book about the same trip. <laughs> And then Oliver Sacks comes out as the patient, and he had all these weird habits, like he had to turn the bed in the motel to face a certain direction or he couldn't sleep, and he had all these anxious rituals, and um, it was interesting. So, <laughs> the, uh, oh, no, let me just push, put one other plug in for a wonderful pair of patient caregiver books where I was not quite a family member, but Lucy Greeley uh, was a poet who had, um, 
had a jaw um, tumor when she was nine and then underwent chemotherapy and they had to remove her jaw and then she had all these reconstructions and ended up with a pretty disfigured face. Um, not horrific, but enough to make her just you know, feel awful and have different thoughts about what it was happy to be a, be a woman and be attractive and look like that. And, um, and she wrote a book called, um, my heart is my face, somebody probably here knows it. I think it's Autobiography. Autobiography of a Face, thank you, which is a great book. And then after she died, um, her best friend, Ann Patchett, who was also a writer, wrote a book called, Love say it louder. Love Love Yes, yes, Truth and Beauty, yeah, thank you, sorry. Um, and even though I can't remember their titles, they're both really good, and, and the the reversal, I actually ended up liking Ann Patchett's better, maybe it's, she wasn't, you know, she didn't have to deal with being ill while she was writing it, but um, but the truly, totally different views of what was going on were really amazing, uh, and both beautifully written. So, um, and then, oh yeah, one other thing I want to say is, um, people come to me sometimes as a doctor because I've been a, a writer and been sick and stuff, and I just wanted to give you one other warning, which is that you know there is a there's kind of a lovely idea about wounded healers where people who've been through it know more about it and and they can help you through it, and that's totally true. Like that's why women prefer female gynecologists, for example. But anyway, um, so but I have to say to them, you know, like the real the other da danger though is I'm going to project my experiences on you if I take care of you as a patient and. Um, and so that, to some extent, I write illness narratives or publish them so that people will know like my biases and, and, um, and there are things that I've been through and so I see them everywhere, you know, even when they're not. And uh, so there's that like kind of carpe, caveat emptor um, aspect of writing in that respect. So but let's turn to why anybody would want to read all these narratives. Um, and one reason which is a little bit facile, but I wanted to mention it because um, it's been important to me, is uh, you read them if you want to write them. And so the only thing is you should read them in a very different way. Um, the the kinds of things when you're reading at, to, to be a writer is something I've had to sort of train myself to do, to notice narrative structure, five minutes. Um, it's my last slide, though. Uh, and the, um, and the, the main thing that's been hard for me and maybe for some other people is it was actually very hard for me to realize that narratives have to have suspense to keep people reading because in medical school you're trained to get all the ideas out as fast as you can. You don't want to keep anyone guessing about what's going on uh, and the way, for instance, scientific papers are written. You have an abstract that tells you everything right there. You don't even need to read the rest of that stuff. And um, <laughs> so writing illness narratives like that Really boring, and I know I'm going to live. You know, I know I live through it because I say it on the first page and so forth. But a second reason, and much more broad, to to read illness narratives uh, is to learn practical tips. And I think a lot of uh, people do read for that reason, or even this is a little bit less practical, but just to get a name for what they're going through. Like so many people, like say with Tourette's, will say, "Oh my God, when I read." Um, um, Jonathan Lethem's uh, Motherless Brooklyn, and I realized that that was, you know, that the, the main character has, has Tourette's. Um, that was what, that was my experience, and I didn't even know to call it that, and some of the things that she, to have words for it, it's sort of Adam's task to mean things, and it can be really helpful. But um, there again, we have to be careful about this whole idea that anecdotes are not proof of anything, and so the tips that you learn from a book where a guy's miraculously cleared. Oh, and, oh, this was so painful. One of my patients who was uh, who had bipolar disorder, a college student, his mother took him to see a beautiful mind. He was an MIT student. And at the end, she said, see, he got better without med, which was totally not true of John Nash, if any of you have seen that. Um, and she was trying to tell her son that he should just like buck up and stop taking his meds and just like use willpower to get better. And so that was like, A, it was misreading the anecdote, but B, it was just a single guy. Um, but I think maybe a, a more uh, uh, a, a more kind of moving aspect of reading these books is you do get a sense of community. If you're someone with a rare illness or just any illness at all, and surrounded by healthy people, to know that other people are there and going through what you go through, it turned out to be really um, surprisingly helpful for me. I just I read a lot of like what you might call sick chick 
books, you know, like the bell jar and um, and all those things where people went crazy and it was like, oh my God, you know, somebody else has, has been through this and it was really helpful. And I apologize for this jokey tone that I have because what I'm saying is actually really serious, but somewhere is crossed in my brain and I can only be humorous in certain situations. There's actually a, a this is what doctors do to people, they, there's a name for that which is um, uh, Witzelsucht, it's inappropriate humorousness. So in from frontal lesions, I have that. Um, but it's really important, the sense of community people can have. Now that there's the internet, it's a little easier for patients to, co to connect with each other. But back when I was young, we only had books. And um, the, that's, that's just really, uh, but there's also, and I think that sometimes gets overemphasized though, because there's also learning about the other and some of the, the memoirs that I've read, like Anatole Broyard, it's called um, uh, Intoxicated by My Illness, where he had prostate cancer and was dying of it. And the way he wrote about it, it was, you know, it was pretty alien to my experience, but it was so engaging and taught me about things that I'd never thought about. So we don't want to make it too, it's not too clannish, like people with R RA have to only read books with other people with RA and so forth. Um, and the... Then the last thing, and this is so obvious that I'm going to put it right at the end and not even talk about it very much, is simply that we can read books like that about people who have things other than what we have to learn about it and to learn how to help them. And this is going to sound really dopey, but I actually didn't realize how much pleasure it could be to help people. When I went to medical school, I actually went for totally the wrong reasons, not that I told the people in the interviews why I wanted to go, which was to get more lab money for my lab. But, um, I had no idea that, that I could find it so rewarding. And it turned out that like one of the joys of my job is that actually helping other people feels really good. And so to the extent that some of the memoirs that I read have helped me do that, um, that's been invaluable to me. And uh, so that's the end of my talk.